Today we're looking at servos. I suppose really it's part one because we're not going to be looking at how to mount them, uh, how they physically control other activities or the electronics that make them work. Instead, we're looking at the internals of a variety of different kinds of servo, the mechanical characteristics or specifications and the, the electronics inside the servo itself. Servos get their name from the Greek servus, meaning slave, because that's what a servo actually is. It simply moves to a rotational position that it's told to go to. Nothing else. Having said that, it's very useful in many applications. You'll find them in military use, you'll find them in commercial and production use, you'll find them in all kinds of domestic situations for a variety of applications. And in the hobby market, more and more in use. You'll see here examples where they're used from oil aircraft, the steering and model boats, racing cars, robots, and so on. And from our point of view, in the model railway sphere, they can operate points, they can operate semaphore arms, animated features such as you see there, the water crane, uncouplers, barrier gates, and more. And the crane's back again. What are the benefits of switching to servos? Well, well, they're relatively inexpensive, especially if you buy uh, clones from the internet. For their small size, they have quite a high torque because they've got a gearbox built in. And you can make them go to the same position again and again and again with reasonable accuracy, depending on the quality of the servo you actually use. And for model railway point operations, they're a safer bet than solenoids. Solenoids have the downside of the constant bang bang of capacitive discharge units, eventually damaging points, whereas servos can be moved very slowly and gently and more prototypically. That's because we're able to set the speed of a servo. If you want a fast action between two points of an arc, that's fine. You can say an animation or an uncoupler, fine. If you want to be a gentle movement as in moving a, a point blade, then we can set a slow speed. It's up to us. If you want to, and it's beneficial, we can set the, the settings remotely. And it, a servo can take up more than one position, as you can see there. Here's a three-way point. We covered that in a previous video that you'll find on our website or on our YouTube channel. And it works with a variety of operations. It doesn't matter whether it's DC, DCC, using proprietary kits or MERV kits, whether it's control panels or computer controlled, they can all use servers quite easily. And it doesn't matter the gauge that you're using. Servers can work in all usual model railway gauges. A couple of factors have to be looked at though. They have to have their own mounting brackets. There's a variety of different styles and benefits that will be covered in a part two. And they don't work from your normal 12 volt supply. Usually somewhere around five volts is the normal. And they'd have to then have some kind of voltage regulator. And of course, some electronic equipment. We can't operate servos simply by throwing an on-off switch. 
or a double pole double throw switch. We have to use electronic circuitry as we'll show you shortly. If you buy the, the cheap end of the market, if you buy clones, then they can wear out as little as 25 hours of continual use. Don't panic, that doesn't sound like a lot, but let's say for example, a point takes three seconds to slowly move from one end to the other. That would still mean you could have 30,000 point operations before it got beyond the guaranteed wear. So even cheap servers can be very long lasting. So what do they look like? Well, here's a selection of typical servos used in modeling. They tend to be from a range of given sizes, different uh, uses depending on how much work they have to do. And you can see there's grades there from large scale. The big beast at the top used probably in the you know, O-gauge or where you've got heavy cranes to operate, that kind of thing. Right down to the ultras and the linear servos and the tiny category that's not been given a name but being from Scotland, I just call them super wee toties. Absolutely tiny, small enough to fit inside a coach to open doors, that kind of thing. And if you go to this website, you can look at the entire range of Futaba's servos, giving you all the specifications for each one. That raises the question of how do we control servos? Well, as you can see, the servo has a three pin connection. Two of them take five volts power to the servo and the third wire is a signal wire which sends the commands to the servo. The signal consists of a stream of pulses repeating 50 times per second. with the width of the pulse determining the degree of rotation. As you'll see here, a typical servo with a pulse width varying between one millisecond and two milliseconds, producing a 180 degree rotation. Not always true in practice. Some servos only can handle about 90 degrees, 110 degrees. Some can handle up to 180 degrees. It varies by the servo. Look at the specs. Although most models agree that 1.5 millisecond pulse width will leave the servo horn in mid position. So here we have the servo set up and we're looking at the pulse width which is repeating every 20 milliseconds. If we zoom in a bit to see a bit closer, then you'll see as I widen the pulse width, you increase the rotation. Narrower pulse width, rotation in the other direction. That servo signal is a constant stream of pulses if required. If mechanically it's subject to stress and constant back pressure, then you require a constant stream of pulses to keep it in that position. However, if it's lightly loaded or there is friction to hold it in place, then you can send a short stream of pulses and then stop. 
This video shows a servo constantly jittering. You can see that the incoming signal stream is not clean. This could be interference, it could be poor power regulation, it could be a poor quality servo controller electronics. Next, let's have a look inside. We take the back off a servo, we'll see a small printed circuit board, an electric motor and a little potentiometer. So here we have it. The three wire cable comes in, plugs into the electronics board. The electronics controls the motor, the motor attaches to a set of gears, the gears in turn rotate the servo arm, or the horn as it's called. But you'll see that the servo arm in turn rotates a potentiometer, and that's connected back to the electronics once again. So in essence we have an electric motor with a couple of drivers such that if we put positive and zero one way the motor turns in one direction, if we reverse the polarity the motor rotates in the other direction. There's the setup. The incoming pulse from the signal wire feeds into the electronics which then converts it into a voltage level and that is called the target voltage that determines where it wants to go but as we said the pulses come in feed the motor the motor takes the pot and the pot feeds its setting back. So we've got a, a circular activity going on here. You'll see the dotted line indicates a mechanical connection between the motor and the variable resistor, the pot. And it feeds back a voltage into the comparator you see there. So we have the target where it wants to end up and the feedback voltage of where it currently is. And the motor will rotate until the feedback voltage is equal to the target voltage and then it cuts off the power to the motor. It may have to rotate the motor clockwise or anti-clockwise to get to that figure. So far so good, what we're saying we have a servo that can rotate over a certain arc, potentially with infinite points all along that arc of tiny fractions of a degree. And that's fine if the servo has got a very close tolerance manufacture and also if the electronics that's controlling it, the pulse width, it's, it's got a quality pulse. In other words, its pulse width stays the same every single iteration without any tiny movements. And these exist at a cost. But for the general hobby use, we have a problem. And that is that if we send a pulse with that amount and move to that, amount of uh, rotation and even the smallest change would make the servo try to, to follow it. So 
with electronics that's not at uh, 100%, then we're going to get jitter, as you saw in an earlier video. So the way around it is what's called dead band. You say, that's the, the current pulse width. And if it changes significantly, I'll move the servo. But if it only moves a tiny fraction, I'll ignore it. Otherwise, I'm going to have the servo continually flickering, which is bad mechanically, but also it's drawing constant current as a consequence. So we're looking at dead band. Let's look a bit uh, more detail. So in practice, the dead band sets up a compromise between stability and the rotational accuracy, the resolution of the servo. We're trying to avoid tiny overshoots causing a problem mechanically and current-wise by making the servo ignore small input changes. In practice, the dead band sits somewhere between 1 microsecond and 10 microseconds, depending on the servo that you, you use. Here's a typical servo specification, the well-known tower brand SG90s and, and their clones, with a dead band you'll see there of 10 microseconds. If you pay more, you can get one, quite a bit more, but the dead band is only one microsecond. Two typical examples. So if you have close tolerance in terms of the, the servo you buy, and close tolerance also in the electronic circuitry, then a small dead band servo is fine. In fact, it gives you better accuracy and resolution. But in the normal hobby world, we've got a more loose tolerance in terms of electronics. This signal is a bit less stable, a bit more prone to, to problems. And if a larger, a wider bandwidth is used to solve these potential problems. There's an example of the SG90. Let's assume for a moment it's got a 90 degree angle that can handle and it's a 10 microsecond dead band. As we know, the incoming pulse can vary between 1 and 2 milliseconds. In other words, a range of 1 millisecond, which is 1000 microseconds. Which means if it can only work on 10 microsecond jumps we only get 100 distinct steps or put another way for 90 degrees for 100 steps we get an accuracy of 0.9 degrees just under a one degree accuracy which for most applications isn't significant for operating points and signals and so on, animations. Dead band problems also associate with sticky and blocked points because you never actually get to the hitting zero difference between the, the uh, target and the feedback voltage. And all the other incorrect alignment, incorrect settings, poor power that you mentioned, interference and so on. Or using zero dead band servos or one microsecond dead band servos in situations where 10 microseconds is more appropriate. There are other issues that affect servo performance. When you first switch on power to a servo, there could be a moment when it has got no incoming signal to create a target voltage. The motor doesn't know where to stop and you get a kick. 
This happens at power up only and depends on the quality of the servo you've purchased, particularly a problem with uh, clone servos. There are various solutions advocated for it, including making the signal wire have a constant pull up or a pull down, or powering the servo after you've created the signal stream. Servo twitching, on the other hand, occurs during normal operations. Especially if you have long extension leads on your servos. You're picking up unwanted interference on the signal. And it's usually helped by making sure that the runs to the servo are kept away from runs for the traction or maybe placing a 100 nanofarad capacitor on the signal wire itself down to zero volts or if the situation allows for it to stop the train of signal pulses after a few seconds to make sure that the, the servo has reached its destination but is then more immune to interference. Before moving on, it's best to mention that you may have noticed that servos take a high current initially before settling down to a lower current draw. That's because when you first power up the servo to move, it's stationary. There's no back EMF and therefore you draw the stall current. We've covered the issue of stall current previously. Have a look at our video on motors. Moving on, let's look at a typical servo specification. We'll look at the Tower Pro SG90. You'll see first of all that it works on 5 volts, as we mentioned previously. Its weight and its dimensions, normally not a big issue in model railways because we can put the servo under the baseboard or inside a building and therefore they are not particularly important specifications. The next factor is its torque, measured either in ounce inches or kilogram centimetres. It describes the rotational force, the ability to move a weight, either pushing or pulling it. The SG90 is quoted at 1.8 kilogram at one centimetre, which means that if you attach a weight one centimetre away from the centre, of the horn, it can push or pull that weight with any greater weight resulting in the motor stalling. So we can handle up to that weight. If we then move the weight further away from the centre, so now we're two centimetres away from the, the centre, then of course we, we've doubled the distance, we got to half the weight that we can move. If you want to have an animation, for example, with a, an even greater arc of movement, we can put on a, a longer horn. 
In this case, we have increased from one centimeter to five centimeters, and in turn, the torque will be reduced by a factor of five. So the 1.8 now becomes 0.36. On one of our demonstration layouts, we've got a die-cast lorry parked behind the shed and has to come round in quite a sweeping arc. So we've got a heavy weight and a wide arc. Underneath, we used a more powerful servo and replaced the plastic horn with square brass. The smaller SG92 is left. Has it a lighter load? It just opens the door and therefore doesn't have to have the same amount of torque. Now analog servos have a particular issue with torque. Just for a moment look at these statements from the manufacturers. The servo's built-in motor controller uses pulse width modulation. And what it's saying is that the width of the pulse will depend on the degree of arc that has to be encompassed. If we're moving from a point A to point B over a wide arc, then we'll have a, a greater uh, pulse width to apply more power to get across. However, if it's a small angle of change, then a narrower pulse is supplied. And that results in less torque when you have to go over smaller distances. To show that effect, I've got a Merg servo controller kit attached to a servo. I've taken the wires from the PCB that normally go to the motor, and my oscilloscope is looking at what's coming out of the controller. Let's have a look. If we've got a small amount of travel, then the pulse width is narrow. If I've got a large amount of travel, then the pulse width is almost DC. Small amount to travel, large amount to travel. The next characteristic is the speed of rotation, normally given as a time to travel through a 60 degree arc. In the case of the SG90, it's a tenth of a second, 100 milliseconds. So if it has to go a full 180 degrees, then we're looking at roughly a third of a second. Depending on the quality of the servo, that turn rate for 60 degrees could be anything between 0.05 of a second to nearly a quarter of a second. To be honest, it's not a especially a big issue in model railways because we're not going to be moving points very rapidly or signals very rapidly or animations extremely rapidly. Servos are available with a variety of different materials used for the gearbox. In the case of the SG90, as you can see, it's made of plastic or nylon. Probably the most common method used, also the cheapest type of servo. And they work perfectly happily in 
light use. Not so great under heavy use. They have a certain amount of play in, in the, the gears, but they are prone to breaking, the teeth getting broken off if they're subject to shock. And to avoid that, you can also get servos with metal gears. They're more expensive, they're noisier, but everything is metal. The gearbox and the output shaft are both metal. So they can take a much greater load without breaking, but they suffer from the highest rate of wear being metal on metal. And as the teeth wear down, of course, you eventually lose accuracy. So, along comes gears made from carbonite, resin based. Much more sturdy than nylon, much harder wearing than nylon. You can still shear under vibration or shocks. Less slop than nylon, so they're more accurate and less wear than metal. And you'd expect they're more expensive than their nylon counterparts. There's an example of a carbonite servo. Now, although many servos may look similar, there are some mechanical as well as electronic differences. For example, the splines used. In other words, the, the shaft with teeth on it varies between manufacturers. So if you look down the right hand side of that table, you'll see high tech has got 24 teeth around this, the spline. Futaba, 25 tower 25 and so on. So it follows then that sometimes a horn from one servo will not fit on to the spline of another servo. Another difference between manufacturers is how the servo rotates in relation to the input signal. For example, of the high tech the wider the incoming signal pulse, the more the horn will rotate clockwise. While a Futaba is goes in the opposite direction. The wider the pulse width coming in, the more it rotates counterclockwise. And of course, if you buy an unbadged clone, you've no way of knowing which direction it will turn until the postman delivers it through your letterbox. The specification may also include information about the quality of the servo. For example, whether it's got a high quality motor, double ball races, long life bearings and so on, which all add to the long term life of the servo, but usually cost quite a bit more. Once again, do we require that kind of quality generally on a layout? And the last one we'll look at on that spec is the type of modulation. It tells you it's an analog servo. So more or less everything we have discussed so far has been looking at analog servos. But there's a range of servo types, and we'll look at each of these briefly in turn. Starting with digital servos. If it wasn't for the label on the side of the servo, you wouldn't be able to tell an analogue apart from a digital servo. They use the same casing, they use the same motors inside, the same gears, they connect with the same 
three wire interface and in fact in most cases they have this exact same signal stream coming in. So what makes them different? Here's Futaba's take. In the left hand side you see a normal analog servo, they call a standard servo, and it's got its own circuitry that converts the pulse width into a reference voltage. It's got its own comparator built onto that PCB. But on the right hand side that has all been replaced with a microprocessor so it can do things that the analog can't do. Like what? Well there's the traditional analog with the feedback coming in to the, the comparator. And we still have the analog feed coming back from the pot into the microprocessor. So far, so similar. The difference is that the analog is receiving the pulses 50 times a second and acts on them 50 times a second, whereas the digital may be receiving the same pulses 50 times a second, but can act on them 300 times a second, which means it can have a faster response and potentially and a more constant torque. Why? Well, you, you may remember what we said is receiving pulses more often and the torque is affected by the distance it has to travel as we discussed earlier. The key being the second sentence the motor has little torque when the differences are small moves and given the fact that most model railway applications were making a collection of small moves that go from point A to point B not as one very fast jump but as a sequence of small steps so we slowly move the point over and that's when we get the least torque. High tech explain that by saying that as soon as you go one degree off the center point you're still getting the maximum torque. So it's even torque, no matter what amount of movement you want the servo to rotate to. Here's another chart from Futaba. The left hand side being the analog servo, the right hand side being the digital servo. As you can see, every 20 milliseconds you get a pulse and you only act on it that way, whereas on the right hand side you'll see many more pulses, which of course will mean that more often power getting to the, the, uh, the servo, therefore more torque. So the quick response comes from potentially the analog updates every 20 milliseconds, but it's possible if you had a, a change of pulse every 3 milliseconds instead of every 20 milliseconds, then you can act on it much more quickly. So if we have electronics that can feed a digital servo with pulses on a more regular basis, we get better torque. So they will still work with ordinary analog controllers, of course, but take this for example, the robot shop, 12 channel controller for 12 servos, but the key is the bottom left, if you can see it there, where it tells you that you can change the pulse rate from anything up to 333 hertz over six times more frequent than the standard 
server stream. Gives you a quicker response, of course, and more torque. Here is a chart that Chick had prepared earlier, which summarises the difference between analog and digital servers, including issues such as greater torque in a digital servo at the expense of higher current. And some haven't covered the noise from an analog servo is, of course, at uh, 50 Hz, so you may hear a hum. Whereas, potentially, you can hear 300 Hz coming from a digital servo. Next on our list are linear servos. They work in the same way as normal servos, except the movement is linear instead of rotational. Here's an example of a commercial offering. Those tiny little linear servos that are commonly found on model aircraft because they're so small and so light. Let's have a look at one. These are more expensive than SG-90s, but are very useful where space is a premium. For example, uh, inside a coach for sliding doors. Where space is not a, a problem, you can convert a rotational servo into a linear servo with a rack and pinion kit such as this one. And here's it in operation. Let's look next at Continuous Rotation Servers. As the name suggests, these servers don't move to specific points, but rather act like a normal motor, albeit still controlled by a server controller, as we'll explain later. You can buy these commercially, as in this example, or you can convert a normal servo into being a continuous servo. It's not unknown for hobbyists to uh, blow up a servo. Normally it's a little electronics board that goes. But that still leaves a motor and gearbox. So we can take away the PCB and turn it into a DC motor. On the left we have the standard servo wiring. So firstly we remove the PCB and its associated connections and simply wire the power to the tabs of the motor itself. However, there's one other job. The gearbox as a plastic tab, as you can see there, arrowed, that limits the rotation. So that has to be cut away, removed, to allow for continuous rotation. Normally, with a pair of cutters, followed by a sharp knife, will do the trick. Now, 
And here is the motor wired to the output of a Merg speed controller kit fed from a 5 volt supply such that turning the shaft of the potentiometer will make the motor rotate faster or slower. So we've managed to salvage a server that had a, a damaged PCB and turned the servo into a straightforward DC motor. Albeit we still have to have a double pole, double throw switch if we want to change rotational direction. But we can take a fully functioning servo and convert it. So we take advantage of the PWM drive to the motor and achieve bi-directional rotation without the need for an external switch. As in this example from Adafruit using two servos in the continuous rotation mode to provide both speed and direction of travel. Step one as before is to modify the gear such that you allow for continuous rotation but there's a second important step regarding the feedback mechanism. Here is the existing setup as we discussed earlier. When the motor rotates, it in turn rotates a potentiometer to provide positional feedback. What we're going to do in this case is alter it to that. We have broken the physical link between the motor rotation and the rotation of the pot. There's now a constant voltage being used as a feedback level. The only time now that the motor is not rotating is when the fixed feedback voltage and the reference voltage coming in happen to be the same. Otherwise, the motor will be continually rotating one way or the other. And how do we achieve this midpoint reference voltage to feedback? Well, the common way is to rotate the servo arm until the pot is in mid position, take off the power and then cut the rod that connects between the motor and the pot. Or if you don't want to do that, replace the wires that go to the pot with two separate fixed resistors of equal value. For a greater explanation, have a look at these two YouTube videos. Here is a video showing a modified servo being controlled by the Merg Servo Controller Kit. The servo is stationary, but if I move the pot We can change the speed from fast to slower to slower until I get to stop and then I can go very slowly in the other direction or faster or fast. And again, slow down to stop using the servo tester kit.
So what's happening here? Well, there is only one setting of the controller that will produce a reference voltage that's identical to the feedback level. In other words, stationary position. In all other cases, there's no match and the motor will rotate in one direction or the other trying to get a match, which is impossible because the reference voltage now is a fixed value. Or to put it another way, the direction of rotation depends on the incoming signal pulse width with the exception of the stationary setting. In terms of speed, we've already noted that the PCB will drive the motor greater if it's got a, a larger difference between the incoming reference voltage and the feedback. In other words, the more we turn the, the pot, the faster the speed will go. So the one pot controls direction and speed with the midpoint being stationary. One of our members is also a member of the Meccano Society and this is his test setup where we're checking the speed and confirming that we're reusable torque even at slow speeds. And lastly, let's look at servos that have external feedback. Normally, the feedback from the pot connects to the PCB inside the servo case itself. But you can have servos that have an external connection from that pot. As in this example here, you'll see that it has the normal three pin connector for the power and the incoming signal but also a fourth connector which connects directly to the slider of the pot and therefore as the pot rotates the value coming out on that wire will also change. It allows you to monitor what's going on because it's one thing to say move the server to that certain position but how do you know it's got there? apart from visually. Well, electronically, if you know it has to go to a certain position, if you don't get the corresponding value back on that feedback wire, you know there's something impeding it from doing its job. Adafruit cites these examples of what could go wrong and why you'd need some confirmation that the server had moved to its exact position. To that we could add on, for example, points. It's one thing to tell the server to move a point, but how do you know whether the server actually did move to that? Maybe there was a broken wire. Maybe the power was down. Maybe there was ballast stopping the blades from going fully across. This could be particularly useful if you're automating a layout because as we know it's common for ballast to get into points and prevent them from going fully over and the most common way to notice that is to have micro switches or sensors on the tie bars so when the tie bar moves, it will activate that particular sensor and you know it's gone fully over. Because that involves mechanical uh, connections, which themselves can be go out of alignment, and extra components. If you use one of those servers with feedback, you know exactly what voltage you should be returned on that wire for each of the two 
movements of the tie bar. So you can tell where it's gone properly one way or the other. With no other components, it becomes a one wire alternative to external micro switches or sensors. As you can see, servos that provide the external feedback can be expensive, but there's nothing to stop you amending a normal servo to do the exact same thing. As you can see in this picture, the three wires that come from the pot run down the middle of that PCB, and the yellow wire is the extra wire that I've soldered in to the, the slider of the pot. And now I can measure the voltages for various settings of rotation. And here is the experiment to do it. I have taken the yellow wire and put it onto my voltmeter. Because we'd have to calibrate for each servo. It depends the the model we make. It depends on the amount of rotation. But you can check what voltage you expect to get for the end points for your own needs. And then your software can check for those particular levels to see whether they've met them correctly. Let's look at the video. Well, here we have the servo with the tapping off the pot and we'll just see what the readings are from one extreme to the other. So, just under a volt in one direction and it's climbing up to 2.435 in the other direction. Between 2.4 and 0.93. So that's my look at the range of servos that are out there for modelers. Are there any questions or comments or suggestions?